it is a huge pleasure uh, to be here, great honor. Uh, it's actually uh, my, not only my first time in the university, but incredibly, uh, my first time ever in the city of Plymouth. Uh, and I've been here for 24 hours, and that's 24 hours that means I'd like to come back, because it's a pretty nice place. Anyhow, um, let me uh, get going. I'm going to uh, talk for about 20 minutes, hopefully. Sometimes I wind on a bit um, and leave a few minutes for some questions. Uh, but as I get going, can I just uh, start by asking all of you, um, how many people here have never heard of antimicrobial resistance? One person. That's, now, that is a first. Uh, I have, in the three years since I came across this topic, um, I often ask that question in many parts of the world, and there is usually somewhere from 25 to 50 percent, sometimes more than that, of the audience who put their hand up when I say that. Uh, and one of the reasons, I think, why somebody like me was asked to lead this review was partly because of that dilemma. And amongst the many complexities of antimicrobial resistance, uh, I'll come back to give you a small personal hint in a second, uh, is because um, the scale of its challenge is way bigger than the awareness of, of it by people all over the, uh, the planet. Um, at its core, uh, it is uh, the growing uh, resistance uh, by the bugs that are naturally in us uh, to antibiotics uh, and in animals and in fish, uh, as well as other forms of uh, antimicrobials. And uh, if we don't do something about it, uh, it's, we're probably heading for a pretty grim future. I think that's the simplest way to, uh, to describe it. And what was so interesting about why somebody like me was asked um, is that uh, Sally Davis, Chief Medical Officer, as there's somebody you need to get to come here at one point. Uh, any of you know Sally Davis here? Uh, she is idiotically obsessed, quite rightly, uh, with antimicrobial resistance. She actually wrote a small book about it. Uh, I think in 2011, a little penguin book. And she persuaded uh, the head of the civil service, Jeremy Haywood, uh, and together with him, they persuaded the prime minister that this was uh, such a threat to the future of the world, it should be one of the top five risk issues for the United Kingdom. Uh, and as part of trying to persuade him to do that, somebody, Sally claims it was her, and she's a pretty incredible woman, so it probably was, but others also claim it was them, said that, why don't we get somebody that's not a scientist to lead a review uh, and come up with some ideas about how the world can do something about that? And in that regard, for those of you, I'm sure who are many of you, so uh, interested in the hugely important challenge uh, to do with climate change, uh, some thought had been given and had been impressed by what Nick Stern had done as an economist uh, for the remarkable work he led uh, in that sphere. So the Rolodex for some reason stopped at me uh, and I got this phone call, would I do this thing? And I have to say, and this is not that much more than three years ago, I actually couldn't even pronounce antimicrobial resistance when I got that call. Uh, my wife was actually with me, who is, is a scientist by training, and uh, I love to make this joke, but it's true. We were actually going to a wine tasting thing that our son had bought me as a birthday present, and when she heard what this call was all about, she said it would be the first time in 30 years that not only can I understand what you're doing, but I've actually got any interest in it. So, <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, I was asked to come up uh, with a ridiculously ambitious task, um, and this was, I agreed in May, 2014, but I didn't start on it because I was doing the city stuff until September of that year. And that uh, sometime within 18 to 24 months, we had to come up with such compelling ideas that it would, amongst other things, result in a, a so-called high-level agreement at the United Nations to do something about it. And I like a challenge, I think. Uh, and I had no idea what the hell it was, and that's partly fulfilled why I decided to leave my old life. I thought, why not? And so I uh, put together a small team uh, that was based at the Wellcome Trust, uh, and off we went. And I'm going to give you a very little flavor of, of what 
was all about. So the first thing was, and, we, and it was done as an economic and financial thing. So I am not a scientist, and indeed I deliberately decided in the earliest days that I wasn't going to try to kid myself I could become as knowledgeable as everybody who was a scientist about this topic. In fact, one of the things I joked with Sally, that there is so much damn knowledge and agreement about this, why do you need anyone to do it? Uh, and she started to give me the answer. I said, I, I know, if I may rudely say so, I suspect why. It's because you all talk to each other and have no way of communicating to the rest of the world, uh, and so nobody either can or wants to listen to what you have to say. And she said, yeah, that's kind of about it. So that made me stick to the idea of why I was asked, because of my own background, and stick to those principles. So I'm just going to give you a quick flavor. So the first thing we did uh, is I got the team with some consultants to look at the world of 2050, so at the time, 35 years into the future, deliberately, because that's what had made the whole BRIC story so famous. BRIC stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China. And in 2001 and then 2003, uh, we showed this world where if all these strange countries reached their potential, they would collectively become bigger than the uh, most advanced countries, the so-called G7. So what I decided to do here was, why don't I look at that world again, but in this case, shock it with if the AMR problem grows exactly as somebody like a Sally Davis uh, said it would. And uh, we spent quite a bit of time on this, and a few months later we published our first paper, and it showed two big numbers which have sort of become the mantra uh, around the world in the space of antimicrobial resistance, although I quickly add, not surprisingly, and maybe with some justification, uh, a couple of scientists have questioned uh, how accurate some of our numbers may be. And I'm, as somebody that's immersed in that kind of world for 30 odd years, uh, unlike the colleagues on my team who were most upset with somebody daring to question their wisdom from all this arduous work, I said, well, they're probably right. But the right answer is nobody else had ever tried to do this before. And despite the criticism of these academics, it was interesting that they didn't try to put some alternative numbers on it, which was itself a separate story. But anyhow, we showed that uh, if something doesn't happen about this, uh, by 2050, there could be 10 million that's 10 million people a year dying. Uh, fascinating side thing, say quickly, just as I started doing this is when the Ebola thing broke out. And it was fascinating to me that the world, quite rightly, was in horror about this dreadful tragedy uh, homing in on three uh, African countries. More people die every year now from antimicrobial resistance in Europe than have died from Ebola. I thought, that's quite interesting, and because you can see when there's something about a challenge and a fear of a disease, policymakers do something. And it was something I thought we could learn. Uh, same number of people die in the US from it, and we reckoned about 500,000 people around the world today die from something to do with AMR. But because of its interplay with infectious diseases in particular, especially TB, uh, if we don't do something about it, it's going to become a bigger and bigger and bigger problem. And that 10 million number, whenever, most times there is some story about either some new drug development or some new uh, fear of resistance, the 10 million number is used, which is something we're pleased about. The second thing, which goes to the core of my background and what we have deliberately used many times since, I try to show the economic loss to the world that otherwise would accrue. And, it, and this is what this is, it's $100 trillion. Over the accumulated 35 years between when we did this and 2050. That is, that is an accumulated amount which is bigger than the size of the world today. Uh, and in case I forget to say it, I'll, come, I'll say it now, but I'll say it at the end. Uh, when it comes to the cost of whatever investments or interventions are needed to stop 10 million people dying, um, the investment is tiny compared to that. And so translated into uh, financial uh, returns, and it's something that's resulted in me thinking more and more, which I never did in the past, about health uh, economics and health investment in terms of a preventive sense as some kind of form of global fiscal policy. Uh, because that translates, and I'll come back to this, 
into a total return of 2,500%. Not many hedge fund managers can deliver that, even George Soros. So, against that background, uh, here is what became known, or I talked about, as being uh, the Ten Commandments. Uh, amongst the reasons why it's almost definitely the most interesting thing I've ever done is because of the multi-dimensional complexity and number of different areas that you need to do something about if you're going to solve it. And I'll just quickly spend a minute, uh, on average, on each of the ten things. Um, and again, uh, we looked at them uh, from an economic and financial perspective. And of the ten, I would describe three and a half of them as supply-side boosting interventions. So one of the things you want to do is boost the supply of useful treatments, especially drugs. And five and a half of them are what I'd call demand-reducing interventions, so that we stop treating them like sweets, in essence. The last one, which is kind of neither, is to do with international policy coordination, which I'll finish up on. Uh, the one that's a half in both is vaccines, because obviously if we have more useful vaccines, that's boosting the supply of useful treatments, but it also means if we succeed in doing that, by definition, that reduces the demand uh, for antibiotics. And especially as it relates to food, uh, we were uh, quite shocked as to how little thought and animals had been given to the role uh, of vaccines. But I'll come back. To, oh, I won't come back to that because that's nearly a minute, and I don't have that much time. On, so on the demand side, as a general statement, what really dawned on me early on is doing something about the demand side is more permanent and more important than doing something on the supply side. One of the reasons somebody like me was asked to do this because of the so-called market failure uh, for new drugs. And, and Sally and others were like, what you've got to really come up with are the new model for new drugs. And as important as that was, I realized early on that even if you just succeed in getting every major pharmaceutical company to want to produce new drugs, that will only work for, a new, for, sorry, for an, the next generation because we'll all become resistant to those. What you need to do is shift the demand curve and stop us treating them like sweets and other things. So the first thing is to do with uh, basic health, sanitation, and prevention. Uh, one of Sally's mantras in her book is about washing hands. Uh, there has now become quite a thing in the space, as I'm sure many people hear. Uh, the number of time, if you can wash your hands in warm, soapy warmer, water, uh, at the same time as uh, people sing happy birthday twice, that would have a huge impact on the spread of infections and uh, help control the need for uh, the disease prevention that we have, particularly, of course, in parts of the emerging world. Second thing to do with that uh, is surveillance. Uh, as an economist, I was stunned as to how bad economists quite rightly get criticized all the time that we make lots of ridiculous assumptions and cause the world to have a lot of problems based on useless data. My God, those of you who are scientists and work in this space, yours is pretty bad. Uh, and we were, we were, just before we came to the, the paper with the 10 million and 100 trillion, we had actually naively planned to try and show numbers for 180 countries individually. And it's, uh, in hindsight, it's now funny, but my God, thank God we realized there was something a bit iffy. When it came to Europe, it looked like the simple data we'd got was showing that the UK and the Netherlands we're likely to have a lot more people dying than virtually everywhere else in Europe, which we thought, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And when we delved into the data that this consultant was working on, it was because most of the rest of European countries actually didn't have data, never mind the emerging world, including so-called sophisticated countries. Amazing. So one of the things we came up with, well, you need to do something about that. And as with a number of these interventions, another reason why it's so much fun is as we were traveling on this journey, policymakers were actually picking up on our ideas and trying to do something about it. So how, how many people are here active in the health uh, space? How many of you uh, know of something called the Fleming Fund? One, two, three. So the Fleming Fund was announced about, uh, I think another hand over there, four. Uh, about six months after we first suggested this, uh, that is something the UK government, through DFID uh, and Department of Health, is helping uh, emerging countries 
improve their surveillance system related to this, but obviously in particular to infectious diseases. Fantastic development. Third thing, uh, state-of-the-art diagnostics. Uh, people often say to me, what if any of all of these is the single most important thing of the lot? I say none, but if then they say you've only got one, it would be diagnostics. We all walk around, or especially our kids, with these idiotic things completely dominating our lives. Yet when it comes to this, our do how many people here are doctors? Not many of you, that's only three people I have to apologize to. Four people. We let you guys guess, or we force you to guess because we're so demanding that we, want an, we need an antibiotic. Uh, in every other walk of life, we now have more and more evidence and use of these things to influence what we do. And the single biggest thing is to use state-of-the-art diagnostic technology to stop us all wanting these things to be some miracle sweet. There is evidence that in the most sophisticated places in the world, despite Donald Trump, I guess I can still just about say the US is one of them, evidence of at least 50% misprescription of antibiotics. And of course, there are many parts of the world where you can get them without even having a prescription whatsoever. We need to start using technology. Number four, agriculture. Uh, in many parts of the world, it is a, a bigger problem in animals and fish than it is in humans. The United States almost definitely, China almost definitely, and I don't have time to talk about it more because it's now flashing, I've got five minutes left. Um, but let me just give you uh, a hopeful sign as to how forward-thinking people in this part of the world are. Do, does anybody here work for spoilt pig or know of spoilt pig? Maybe, maybe it was planted in yesterday's Times newspapers. I was traveling down, I stopped to have a cup of tea, and there was this article in the Times about a Devon-based company called Spoilt Pig that is going to be the forerunner of making bacon raised without antibiotics. That is very forward thinking. We used to call, in the US, has anybody ever eaten at Shake Shack in London? I'm guessing there's not a Shake Shack in Plymouth yet. We would call this the Shake Shack Factor. There's this cool, trendy burger place in the States that does the same thing. And because it's so cool and trendy, uh, they're taking market share from some of the big guys. So in the past 12 months, McDonald's, Purdue, all these guys have started to at least pretend, and some of them more serious than the others, that they're going to, at least with chicken, no longer uh, have ones raised on uh, antibiotics. Uh, let me shift to the supply interventions because it's important in my time that I don't miss them. The uh, talked about new vaccines. Um, we need more people that study it. Very simple intervention to solve. What we found fascinating is within the world of health science, hardly any people work on this stuff. And those that do don't get paid much. In the world I come from, that's a relatively easy thing to solve. Linked to it, the second thing is, we need a lot more what we call early stage or push innovation. So we recommended a global innovation fund. Another good thing that happened during the journey is the UK government together with China, sign of this so-called golden relationship, which is turning a bit yellow under Prime Minister May, but uh, it was golden for a while. Uh, they jointly announced some money going into an innovation fund. And despite Trump and despite some other issues about the US and international things, there's some good stuff with significant amounts going on in the US too. And then, in addition, of course, we need new drugs. And in the narrow world of how many pharmaceutical companies think, particularly the big global ones, in their individual business line, the economics of antibiotics are horrible. Uh, they don't give the rate of return from all these other incredibly profitable things that they do. So we spend a lot of time working on some specific incentives or punishments uh, to try and change it. And I would just say, those of you that are interested, keep your eyes on the G20 leaders' statements on July the 7th. It will probably be paragraph number 56 or something, but there is going to be something I'm pretty sure said about that and something that will be following up to try and uh, invigorate uh, the economic model uh, for drug production. Last thing to link it all together, then I'll stop and hopefully have some time to take a few 
questions or a couple of questions. Is all of this uh, is important, many other things I've even mentioned, but it needs to be done everywhere at the same time. When it comes to animals, we deliberately analyze Denmark, or not, we analyze a lot of places, but we deliberately selected Denmark as probably having the best practice of reducing the misuse of antibiotics in animals in the world. Um, and we use that a lot. Since we finished the formal review, there's a really worrying story that because of the resistance to a last in line antibiotic called colistin in farming in pigs in China and the transport of animals, the signs of drug resistant uh, to colistin in Denmark, despite how brilliant they have been. So individual countries can do what they want, but unless everybody's in this journey together, we won't solve it. So on top of the supply and demand issues I've mentioned, proper focused international coordination, just like in climate change, is absolutely crucial. And one of the things that was so pleasing also about our review is we did uh, have a high level uh, UN agreement on it on the 22nd of September last year, only the fourth time ever uh, there's been such a thing in global health, which was very gratifying. And now uh, is the rather arduous and realistic challenge for the UN. To, it's difficult for them to say a lot of things with words, much harder to then actually get on and do what everybody said they were signing up to. But that is in the early stages, but some important things to do with compliance, rules and regulation and so on. Just as importantly as I've touched on, and especially for the market for new drugs, uh, we need international policy coordination from the leading developed countries and hence the G20. And as I've said, I have some hope that we'll get some positive developments coming out of this G20. If not, I will be even more noisy about it than I have been so far. Thank you very much.